Major funding for this series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, by public television stations, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over a hundred years providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers. Additional funding is provided by the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. This program contains scenes of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. In 1946, when the first Vietnam War broke out, the French generals expected to crush the ragged Viet Minh guerrillas in a few weeks. After eight years of fighting, two and a half billion dollars in American aid, and a devastating defeat at Yen Bien Phu in 1954, the war was over and France had lost. Japan replaced France as the dominant power in Vietnam, proclaiming Asia for the Asiatics. After Japan's defeat in 1945, the Vietnamese, led by Ho Chi Minh, declared their independence. They hoped the Allies would support them, but the British, who came to take Japan's surrender, rearmed the French and help them drive the Viet Minh out of Saigon. The Viet Minh fought back, but they had few weapons to use against the French troops, and the Viet Minh's brutal tactics alienated other southern nationalists. The French retained control. In the north, Ho's Viet Minh had widespread support, but they also faced a problem. 150,000 nationalist Chinese troops. The Chinese came to disarm the Japanese. They stayed to loot and disrupt, and they threatened to remain indefinitely. Desperate to expel the Chinese, Ho Chi Minh negotiated with the French. In March 1946, they reached an agreement. The French colonial authorities displayed their power as Ho Chi Minh, president of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, came to confirm the agreement permitting French troops back for a limited period. In return, France recognized the new Vietnamese state, and the Chinese army left. Ho Chi Minh was gambling that the French would not try to seize power and that a long-range agreement could eventually be negotiated. A truce was concluded. There were to be future negotiations to settle the problems between us and France. Under these conditions, we allowed a certain number of French troops to take the place of the nearly 200,000 troops of Chiang Kai-shek, which were to evacuate our country as soon as possible. So we had some breathing time to consolidate our forces. The French in Hanoi greeted the arriving troops as conquering heroes. The Vietnamese stayed home. Ho Chi Minh traveled to France to continue the negotiations, but the French cabinet had collapsed. There was no one to negotiate with. Ho had to play tourist until a new coalition was formed. While he waited, the French administration in Saigon, acting on its own, declared the southern part of Vietnam separate from the north. It was a violation of the March Agreement, and Ho wondered if there was any point to further negotiations. Should I go back home, he asked. He was told the new government would straighten it out in Paris.
In 1946, Ho had been famous as a patriot for a quarter of a century, and the Vietnamese in Paris turned out to welcome this first president of an independent Vietnam. The French greeted the veteran communist formally as a chief of state. At the time in France, communists were part of the government. In public, relations were cordial, but in fact, the French and Vietnamese negotiators were far apart. Ho could not be hopeful in a speech he gave to a group of Vietnamese in Paris. People in Vietnam want their relatives in France to bring presents when they come to visit. Now the Vietnamese who are living in France can also rightly ask their friends and relatives who come from Vietnam, especially Uncle Ho, to bring them some kind of present. But I have no concrete presents for you like fruit, or cakes, or jobs. All I can give you is this slogan. The nation comes first, the fatherland above all else. The negotiations held at the historic Fontainebleau Chateau went badly. The Vietnamese insisted that southern Vietnam was part of their country. The French would not budge. When the meeting began, the chief of the French delegation, Max André, said to me, we only need an ordinary police operation for eight days to clean all of you out. <laughs> there was no need for negotiations. Ho Chi Minh's political credibility was at stake, and he pleaded for some compromise. But there was no common ground. He left in September with only a vague promise of future negotiations. The solution had to come from Fontainebleau. Then the negotiations at Fontainebleau failed. From then on, relationships deteriorated. The climate deteriorated. We arrived thinking we were going to be welcomed by the population, happy to see the French again. Then our opinions changed about the Vietnamese. They don't want us, so we have to make them see reason. And we all had friends in the infantry who had been killed. So there was a growing feeling. After all we did for them, it was the usual way of thinking. We wanted to teach them a lesson. The March Agreement was dead. With French and Viet Minh forces at close range, the fighting escalated. There were provocations on both sides. In November 1946, the French shelled Haiphong. Many French officers believed only force would stop the Viet Minh. When we visited Haiphong afterwards, all the Vietnamese neighborhoods were completely wiped out. They were dead, buried under debris. It is difficult to know the exact figure. But the larger part of the city, it seemed to us, from what we saw, almost the entire Vietnamese part of the city had been destroyed. General Phong tried to reason with General Jap. Listen, I said, I know war, 
Murders, deaths, destruction, bridges blown up, burning houses. This is unthinkable. We have to prevent this. He said to me, you listen. Politics come before economics. The destruction is not important. The deaths, one million Vietnamese deaths, not important. The French will die too. We are ready. It will last two years, five years if necessary. We will no longer give in. By late 1946, Ho Chi Minh's government was forced out of Hanoi, out of the cities. The first Vietnam War had started. The French were confident that they could wipe out Jap's ragtag army quickly. They were a modern army with modern weapons, some bought with U.S. aid. The Viet Minh had widespread support from the peasants. I heard about Uncle Ho, who fought for the rights of the peasants and the workers. So as a peasant who had suffered a lot, I realized that the only correct thing for me to do was to follow the same path. I worked for a long time as a contact person, gathering intelligence on the French military post. We had a person working inside the post. I would go out there and yell at him, saying that he owed me money and that he intended to cheat me of my money. He would then come down to pay me for this supposed debt. He would give me a 10 piastre bill, for example, with a message folded inside it. I would then give him a 5 piastre bill as change. Again, there would be a message folded inside. Without these tricks, the French would have found out and we would have all been killed. When the revolution came, I joined it. Besides carrying a gun to fight the French colonizers, I also wrote songs for the soldiers, for the young people, and for the peasants. I wrote a song for the soldiers in the National Defense League, which was called To the Front. The words of the song are, Forward, brave soldiers. The nation resounds with the words, Fight to the end. March bravely under gunfire. The Vietnamese army is carving out the soul of its fatherland. March forth to victory. March forward with the soul of Vietnam. The French scornfully called the Viet Minh the Barefoot Army. Ho Chi Minh said, we may lose 10 Vietnamese for every Frenchman, but in the end, we will win. They fought a guerrilla war as they built their strength. At first, we did not have any weapons except for bamboo spears. But in the northern part of our country, they were producing arms. I was appointed to go there to report on the situation in the South. Uncle Ho told me that he carried the South in the depth of his heart, and I should tell him what we needed so that the central government could supply us to fight the French and drive them out of the country. I replied that we needed guns. Uncle Ho said that the central government could only give us so many guns because they did not have many. The main thing he said was to capture the enemy's guns and use these guns against them. Yeah. 
The French bogged down in a quicksand war. Again and again, they declared an area pacified, only to find it slipping back into Viet Minh control. The guerrillas seemed to be everywhere and nowhere. In an attempt to take popular support away from the Viet Minh, the French created a rival Vietnamese government, the state of Vietnam. As its ruler, the French picked Vietnam's former emperor, Bao Dai. But they placed so many limitations on his regime that to many Vietnamese, it did not seem at all independent. There was no reason anymore for the war to continue. Well, it went on, because the Viet Minh did not want that kind of independence, labeled Bao Dai independence. They wanted Viet Minh independence. They wanted independence by force, forged in blood, because the Viet Minh were hoping that would unify the country behind them. 1950 brought a new source of help to the Viet Minh. Mao Zedong's forces arrived at Vietnam's borders, having taken all of China. They extended diplomatic recognition to Ho's government, the first country to do so. The Soviet Union followed quickly. And a week later, the United States recognized Bao Dai's rival state. Once again, lines were being drawn in a continuing Cold War. On orders from the Kremlin, Russia had launched a Cold War. The United States was obliged to help Europe safeguard its traditional freedoms and the independence of its nations. Already an iron curtain had dropped around Poland, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, menace to the security and institutions of democratic government. In the early 50s, the United States had a concept of communism, international communism, as a hard monolithic block of China and Russia with no crevices in it that was seeking to expand and gain a dominant position in the world. In Europe, they had taken over Eastern Europe, pushed into Czechoslovakia, and in Southeast Asia, an area in which we had interest, they seemed to be trying to do the same thing. The cause of freedom is being challenged throughout the world today by the forces of imperialistic communism. In May 1950, for the first time, President Truman authorized direct U.S. aid for the French war in Indochina, $10 million, the beginning of an American commitment. They have proved time after time that their talk about peace is only a cloak for imperialism. The U.S. commitment deepened after North Korean troops invaded South Korea at the end of June 1950. It was decided on the very weekend of the uh, North Korean attack that we would step up our aid very significantly to the French and to Southeast Asia because we did not know at that point whether or not the Chinese might attempt to move into that area as a part of a general offensive in Asia. By the end of 1950, the United States had given $150 million in aid to the French forces including planes, tanks, fuel, ammunition, and napalm. As U.S. strategists looked at Asia, they saw a spreading communist menace. The fight in Korea had become an international war. And in Vietnam, the Viet Minh had linked up with communist China. Viet Minh war capacities improved dramatically. Bolstered by his nearby ally, General Jap planned to change his strategy in 1951 from guerrilla warfare to conventional battle. First, he had to secure the supply lines through Lang Son and Cao Bang on the mountainous northern border of Vietnam. We used the new weapons to mount offensives against the French. We were able to wipe out two large French units 
and capture all their weapons. The way was cleared for communications between Vietnam and the outside world. Then we received military aid from China, especially equipment. The defeats on the northern border were a disaster for the French. The Indochina War was no longer just a colonial conflict. It was still small, but it had become international, supported on both sides by major powers. The French sent out a new commander, World War II hero Jean de Latre de Tassigny. General de Latre took control. His charismatic leadership revitalized French morale. General Jap, who had overextended his fledgling troops, was stopped cold and forced to return to hit and run tactics. Politically, though, Ho Chi Minh was gaining strength. In 1950, the Soviet Union and China had recognized his government. In 1951, he reasserted the authority of the Vietnamese Communist Party and renamed it the Vietnamese Workers' Party. In 1951, I left the resistance because I did not want to be a communist stew. Ho Chi Minh and his clique had said that they would disband the Communist Party. But the Communist Party remained intact with its three-man cells and party cells in the army, as well as in the entire administration and population. For this reason, I left. And I remember that when I left the resistance area for the nationalist area, I cried, but I did not have any choice. Most Vietnamese, especially in the north, still supported the Viet Minh against Bao Dai's state of Vietnam. In an effort to give the emperor more credibility and to reduce French casualties, the French formed a national army for the state of Vietnam. They called it Le Jeunissement, the yellowing of the army. De Latre went to the United States to ask for money for Le Jeunissement. Je viens ici en soldat pour expliquer à mes camarades soldats d'Amérique ce que c'est que le problème de l'Indochine, quelles sont nos difficultés. De Latre stressed U.S.-French solidarity, but in fact, relations were uneasy. France accepted American aid, but rejected American pressures to give the anti-communist Vietnamese greater independence. The French knew the Americans would continue to pay for their battle against communism. Je dis tout de suite, merci à l'Amérique, merci à mes camarades des armées américaines. There were a good many among the French who somehow had a uh, an incorrect but rather sneaky idea that somehow the United States was trying to replace them in Indochina. That was the last thing in our minds. We had a basket full. We didn't need to think about such consideration. So it was, it was not easy, and the succession of French governments there were relatively weak politically. They were on narrow edges. And um, the question was how far a French government could go and remain in power. France was averaging a new government every three to four months. Each justified the war on grounds of national honor and the defense of Western civilization. But as public opposition grew, some politicians began to speak out against the war. They wanted at all costs to hide the failure, so they would go all the way, send the troops needed, the money. They were sacrificing so many other things that could have been done in France. And meanwhile, there was nothing to win, but everything to lose. French government pronouncements became more doubtful about success in Indochina. General de Latre's death from cancer in February 1952 seemed to many a symbol of France's continuing losses. The French fought on. 
By the end of 1953, America was paying 80% of the war, over a billion dollars a year. Le Jeunissement, France's Vietnamizing of the war, and other strategies to gain Vietnamese support had failed. The French controlled the cities, but the Viet Minh controlled the countryside. The French controlled the day, the Viet Minh the night. The French public called it the Dirty War. The army was losing officers faster than it could train new ones. Morale was bad among the troops, even though there were no draftees. The war was fought by foreign legionnaires and French colonial soldiers. General Henri de Navarre came in as the fifth French commander in five years. When General Navarre arrived, he opened a file right away, and on that file I wrote, War Goals. We looked for what to tell the troops. Well, until the end, this file remained practically empty. We never could express concretely our war goals. General Navarre tried yet another new strategy. French units were set up in remote areas supplied by air. Their mission was to search out and destroy the Viet Minh. After early successes, the French asked the Americans for more money. The president was receptive. Eisenhower had been elected, promising to end the war in Korea without, as he put it, appeasing the communist aggressors. The Cold War was still on, and Eisenhower's Secretary of State led the crusade. The rulers of communist China train and equip in China the troops of their puppet, Ho Chi Minh. They supply these troops with large amounts of artillery and ammunition made in Soviet bloc countries. They supply military and technical guidance in the staff section of Ho Chi Minh's command at the division level and in specialized units such as the signal... Dulles argued that Indochina would be the first domino. The plan is not only to take over Indochina, but to dominate all of Southeast Asia. The struggle thus carries a grave threat, not only to Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, but also to such friendly neighboring countries as Thailand, Malaya, Burma, Indonesia, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand. President Eisenhower sent Vice President Richard Nixon to Asia as his personal representative. In Vietnam in 1953, Nixon visited the battlefields to show support for the French. He promised more American arms, and he strongly opposed any compromise with the communists. The French planned to test their new strategy in a valley set among the western mountains, 170 miles from Hanoi, Dien Bien Phu. The Viet Minh had passed through the valley during a major attack on Laos. The French expected another attack and thought Dien Bien Phu would be the place to engage them. In November 1953, 12,000 French troops began dropping into the valley under the command of Colonel Christian de Castro. The top French command in Saigon was sure that Jap would never be able to mass enough troops around Dien Bien Phu, never get heavy artillery up the hills, never keep supply lines open. The command at Dien Bien Phu was equally confident. 
the artillery officer insisted that no Viet Minh gun would be able to fire more than three rounds. I saw all sorts of civilian and military authorities go through Dien Bien Phu. Unless my memory is completely twisted, I don't remember a single one. Absolutely not a single one of these authorities who didn't find that Dien Bien Phu was a formidable base. It was the great land and air base. It was untakeable. The Viet Minh saw Dien Bien Phu as a great opportunity but a great gamble, too. Ho Chi Minh's forces had lost heavily in attacks on other French strongpoints, but they decided to take the risk. From Thái Nguyen, it took us about 45 days. We marched at night and rested during the day. Sometimes, we just slept on the roadsides if there were no shelters around. The French were physically large and they had many weapons. But we Vietnamese had something, which we could use as a weapon against them. And that was our morale, our courage. We were determined to fight the French until the end. Because the French came here to steal our land and oppress us. That was how I felt. The French command was inviting a battle because they thought the Viet Minh would never be able to get enough troops and guns to Dien Bien Phu but they did. 51,000 Viet Minh soldiers, four times the number of French troops, crossed the mountains carrying supplies on their backs and bicycles and hauling guns. Chinese and Soviet trucks also brought equipment over roads built by thousands of peasants. And there were Chinese advisors at the battlefront who tried to direct Jap's planning. On the first days, we designed an operation against the entrenched camp. A quick, general attack, which was to annihilate the camp in three nights and two days. But during a staff briefing, after in-depth analysis of the latest information, I realized that such an attack was not 100% sure of success. One of the fundamental rules, if not the most fundamental rule of Vietnamese military science, is that in war you must win. Both sides had a special reason for wanting to win at Dien Bien Phu. At this same time, January 1954, the great powers were meeting in Berlin. They set a date and place, April 26th in Geneva, to meet and discuss Asian issues, including the Indochina crisis. On March 13th, Jab launched his attack on Dien Bien Phu. The battle began as the Chinese advisors had insisted with massive human wave assaults. The heroism of these shock troops has become part of the Dien Bien Phu legend, as in the story of the Viet Minh soldier who stopped a French machine gun. The comrade used hand grenades, dynamite and his guns to try to destroy that machine gun. Finally, comrade Phan Dinh Gop used his body to cover the foxhole. 
The enemy sent up a lot of flares and it was a moonlit night. We all saw how Phan Dinh Gop threw his body over the foxhole. And then the company commander yelled out, Charge! The Viet Minh guns blanketed French artillery from positions so well dug in and camouflaged that the French planes could not get at them. The first post fell within eight hours. By the next day, March 14th, the Viet Minh shelling had destroyed the main airstrip. The French command staff was shocked. Colonel de Caste became withdrawn, uncommunicative. On the second night, the artillery commander committed suicide, saying, I am completely dishonored. Four days into the battle, the Viet Minh controlled the entire perimeter. The cost was high, thousands dead and wounded among the Viet Minh. Overruling his Chinese advisors, Jop decided to change strategy. This decision on the Dien Bien Phu front constitutes for me one of the biggest and the most difficult decisions in my fighting life. As commander, General Von Nguyen Jop decided to end this attack based on the human wave tactic. The entire plan was changed. The attack was stopped and all the heavy artillery pieces were pulled back to a distance. Then trenches and tunnels were dug, and the morale of the troops was rebuilt based on the slogan, advance solidly, fight solidly. Shovels became extremely important weapons. All the cadres and soldiers put most of their time and energy into digging trenches and tunnels. We slowly surrounded Dien Bien Phu with trenches cutting into the airstrip so it could not be used again, slowly tightening the noose around the necks of the French. With the airstrip out, the French garrison was dependent on parachute drops, but Viet Minh anti-aircraft fire forced pilots to fly too high. Supplies began falling into enemy hands. General Jacques' change in strategy was working, and he settled in for a long siege. For the French, Tien Bien Phu became a nightmare. The rainy season started early with drenching downpours. French dugouts and shelters collapsed. Clean water became impossible to find. Medical supplies ran out. No planes could land to evacuate the wounded. Men who were wounded in the trenches sunk under the yard-high mud to die. Yet 4,000 reinforcements dropped into the battlefield, most of them volunteers. And like the Viet Minh, the French side created legends of heroism. At one point, a foreign legionnaire company went into battle singing their paratroop songs. They were followed by a Vietnamese company, but the army of the state of Vietnam was still too young to have its own marching songs. The Vietnamese paratroopers sang the French national anthem as they fought their brother Vietnamese. Dien Bien Phu was in peril, and for the first time, France made urgent requests to the United States to intervene. The French did request air support to help prevent the Viet Minh from uh, winning a victory there. I happened to be present at a breakfast in the White House, a very small breakfast. Uh, Secretary of State Dulles, the President, Secretary of State Dulles, Admiral Radford, myself, one or two others, in which this request was discussed. I recall very vividly that 
uh, Admiral Radford uh, mentioned that he had two carriers standing a couple of hundred miles off the coast in international waters and that he could deliver uh, airstrikes from those carriers in support of the French in Dien Bien Phu. They studied alternatives, including the possible use of tactical atomic weapons. Eisenhower decided the United States should not act alone. Secretary Dulles went to consult the Allies. He made a trip to London uh, in which he discussed this with uh, who was then Foreign Minister Eaton, uh, Anthony Eaton, and uh, felt sufficiently confident from his visit there and his visit to France that he called a meeting in Washington uh, in order to begin preliminary discussions. It was a great shock to him when the British ambassador informed him just a day or two before the meeting was to be held that he was under instructions not uh, to attend. The British were afraid that the Washington meeting would jeopardize the Geneva Conference. Eisenhower would not act without them, rejecting the advice of Vice President Nixon and Secretary Dulles, among others. For now, the United States would not intervene in Vietnam. Ever since the Berlin Agreement to seek peace in Indochina, the communist forces have stepped up the intensity and the scope of their aggression. They have expended their manpower in reckless assaults, apparently designed to improve their bargaining position at Geneva. That is not a good prelude to Geneva. As we went into the conference, there was the concern that we had no relations with communist China. Secondly, if, as seemed probable, the participants would have to recognize the Viet Minh, a communist subversive movement which had derived heavy support from both China and Russia, we would be recognizing at the conference table participants who were basically communist revolutionaries and subversionists rather than a government in existence. Uh, thirdly, there were some who were uh, very much concerned by the prospect of recognizing a subversive revolutionary regime such as the Viet Minh turning over to it territory to administer because this would be the first time since the uh, fall of uh, uh, China to the communists that uh, uh, there had been a further advance in Asia. The conference opened on April 26th with Britain and the Soviet Union presiding. Dulles, a staunch opponent of communist China, refused to shake hands with Zhou Enlai and left Geneva after only a week. Four days after that, the day before the talks formally turned to Indochina, Dian Bien Phu fell. I arrived during the night of May 2nd, and Dian Bien Phu fell on May 7th. The memory I keep of it is one block of time. There was no day or night. I never lay down, I never slept. I don't remember eating. At four in the morning, there was a lull. We were 35 left at my post with one machine gun, one grenade left. So I asked on the radio, I said, since you cannot send reinforcements, he said, where do you want me to get them? You know there is nothing left. Then give me authorization to get out. He answered very simply, saying, no way. You're paratroopers. You're there to die. We built a barricade with corpses at the entrance since we had no sandbags and we waited and we saw the shadows coming one by one, the Viet Minh. I decided to throw my grenade and we immediately got return fire. One of my last impressions was to feel the wall of corpses shivering under the burst of fire. Then a grenade must have hit my helmet because the net was burned and the helmet dented. American helmets are very solid. I lost consciousness and when I came to, there was above me, very close, a surgeon's mask from which a voice came, 
vous êtes prisonnier you are a prisoner de l'armée of the army de la of the democratic republic du vietnam. of vietnam ne bougez pas vous êtes not move. blessé you are badly wounded soigner. and we will take care of you from that moment i had left the greek latin judeo-christian world to pass into the world of the red termites When we arrived, one comrade attacked this entrance. Another comrade attacked the other entrance. They threw grenades in. And I myself ran to the bunker of General de Kastch and put up the flag. The bunker had sandbags piled up in the form of a pyramid. So when I put up the flag, I put the flagpole in the sandbags. Though Viet Minh combat cameramen were present at Dien Bien Phu, scenes of the 55-day battle were restaged by a Soviet director after the French defeat. Some of the film sequences are authentic, some reenacted. Dien Bien Phu cost the French 1,500 dead 4,000 wounded, 10,000 taken prisoner. Many of the prisoners died in Viet Minh camps. The Viet Minh victory at Tien Bien Phu cost them even more, 8,000 dead, 15,000 wounded. You are all aware that the French and their Vietnam ally have suffered reverses notably the fall of Dinh Ben Phu after a superb defense. The present situation is grave, but by no means hopeless. In the present conference at Geneva, we and other free nations are seeking a formula by which the fighting can be ended and the people of Indochina assured true independence. So far, the communist attitude at Geneva is not encouraging. The Geneva conference bogged down almost immediately. The United States delegation was ordered to watch and not to talk. Uh, my instructions were to uh, go to the meetings, uh, to not participate in them, and uh, not to agree to anything, but to uh, be there and sit at the table. And uh, I found it uh, a very uh, difficult job to sit at the table at which people were making discussions and uh, some, of them, some conclusions were being arrived at uh, without uh, agreeing to them and situations in which uh, silence uh, itself tends to give assent. Uh, I can tell you that I was uh, very, very unhappy and perspired uh, very, very freely. Emperor Bao Dai, head of the state of Vietnam, also sent a delegation to Geneva. I was told I should accept the communists at the conference table. I said, no, there is only one Vietnamese state. It is I. The communists are rebels. Given my uncompromising position, they turned the political conference into a military conference. After six weeks, the conference had made no headway. In June, the French cabinet fell, and a new prime minister took over, a critic of the war, Pierre Mondas France. Mondas France made a promise to the French National Assembly. If he could not resolve the Indochina question at Geneva within 30 days, he would resign. The United States feared this meant France might abandon Indochina to the communists. Washington was not at all clear as to what kind of an agreement uh, Mondays France was proposing to make or what agreement he would make. And uh, if the agreement uh, was, was going to be something with which we could possibly live or acquiesce or whether or not we were going to have to denounce it and in effect walk out of the conference, after much secret maneuvering, one week before his deadline, Mondes France got all the participants in place in Geneva. On July 20th, 
the day before the deadline, two issues were still unresolved. At the conference, there were two issues under discussion. One was the temporary demarcation line between the two regions. And the other was the date of the general elections for the reunification of Vietnam. These two issues were closely connected. That was very clear. The Viet Minh, flush with their victory at Tien Bien Phu, took a hard line on both issues. But on the last day, the Soviets and the Chinese forced them to compromise. The Viet Minh, who controlled most of the country, would get less than half. The elections to reunify Vietnam would take place not soon when the Viet Minh would surely win, but in two years. They had been undercut by their own allies. The Soviets and Chinese had several motives, among them fear. If Mendes France failed, France might keep fighting and America might intervene. A peaceful settlement was, insofar as they saw it, the first half of the, uh, the first bite of the apple. Uh, they had half of Vietnam. They had uh, recognition of the Viet Minh as a de facto government by the West and as a government in authority for all of Vietnam by uh, Russia and China. Uh, they avoided the possibility that we might become involved in the hostilities uh, in a way which would uh, represent a very serious setback unless the uh, Russians and Chinese also became involved. I uh, think that the uh, Viet Minh accepted the concept of taking the, the area in two bites, uh, so to speak, uh, because they, they were very self-confident themselves that uh, they could handle the South. And the South itself didn't have uh, viability and uh, therefore uh, it was a fairly good uh, good bet i received the american ambassador who told me in geneva they are going to partition your country then the army that you put together will be demobilized it will become a peacekeeping militia i answered in these conditions, don't count on me anymore. The South Vietnamese delegation made it very clear and very explicit that they were not agreeing to the uh, uh, elections after two years. And we made it very clear that we did not agree to the uh, election provisions that were embodied in the final declaration. As everybody knows, the United States opposed the conference and tried its best to sabotage. When the conference produced results, the United States refused to sign the accord. This attitude explains the subsequent actions of the United States. On July 21st, 1954, only a few hours after Mandas France's deadline, the conference ended with an ambiguous agreement. In fact, there was no single Geneva agreement. The uh, Geneva Agreement, so-called, was a complex of many agreements. The principal ones were the armistice agreements between the Viet Minh forces and the French command. The uh, final piece of paper was a declaration of Geneva, in which the participants at the conference took note, was the usual term. Thus, there's nothing that either we nor the South Vietnamese, quote, violated, unquote, after, quote, signing, unquote, the agreements, because we didn't sign them, and, we didn't, and therefore we didn't violate anything. La raison et la paix ont emporté. Reason and peace have won out. After days and nights of hard negotiations, filled with anxiety and hope, the ceasefire has been signed. In my soul and my conscience, I am sure these are the best conditions we could have hoped for in the present state of things. My own feeling at the end of the conference was that uh, we had probably obtained just about all could, that could be obtained in the light of the situation on the ground. I don't, I don't think we could have obtained, have obtained much more. But I must say, that very honestly, I didn't have not, not have much optimism 
that uh, South Vietnam was going to be able to uh, survive. We thought that having signed the agreements, the French would now be forced by world opinion to carry out the Geneva Accords. And we strongly believed that there would be a general election held in two years, and then the revolution would certainly win. So we greeted each other in two years. We expected to have a general election and reunification in two years. In the fall of 1954, the Viet Minh marched into Hanoi, taking back from the French what they had lost eight years before. To America and the world, it looked like the Viet Minh would soon be marching into Saigon, too, as the French pulled out, taking everything, houses, trucks, factories, even their dead. Washington counted on President Ngo Dinh Diem to save South Vietnam from communism and helped him with guns and advisors. But by 1963, America's leaders had lost faith in Diem and South Vietnamese generals plotted to topple him. America's Mandarin, next on Vietnam. This program was produced by WGBH Boston, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for this series was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities, by public television stations, and by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies, for over a hundred years providing worldwide business and personal insurance through independent agents and brokers. Additional funding was provided by the George D. Smith Fund, the Christopher Reynolds Foundation, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and other contributors. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Vietnam, Box 322, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. TV series Chief Correspondent Stanley Carnot has written the companion book, Vietnam, A History, published by the Viking Press and available in bookstores and libraries. <whistles>